Thank you so much. And I'd like to just say how thrilled I am to be able to be here with you all today. God is very good to us, and we have a lot to be thankful for. And I'd like to say um, it's good to see uh, Donovan and Faye and Crystal and uh, Brian. And, well, I haven't seen Brian yet, but to know he's there. And uh, Rob and uh, let's see, um, some anyone else that was at Camp Ming, some of you I don't think got to Camp Ming, but I missed you, and I'm sorry I did at the Camp Ming. But we're glad that you can be with us now, and I'm glad Jonathan's with us as well, and Mary. And so anyhow, it's a privilege today to talk to each one of you, and I'll try to address my remarks in a, in a uh, proper way. But we're talking about a forever family. Everything about families, you know, everybody has a family. They come from a family, or at least they want to come from a family. And I want to begin by talking a little bit today about adoption, adoption. Um, the, the dictionary definition of adoption is the act or fact of legally taking another, another person's child and bringing it up as if it's your own. And let's see if I can, if I do this, is this going to cause, that may cause us a problem. Let me see if I can, uh, get my controls up here. How can I do that? So Here's a picture. I should have warned you first. You might have wanted to hide your eyes. This could be scary. But this is a picture of my family about 41 years ago. And I'm holding a little baby by the name of Daniel Allen. And we adopted Daniel when he was three months old. Um, Daniel's birth name was, well, he was given a name by social workers, uh, but they gave him the name Larry. Larry Peters, I think it was sort of a generic name. He came from a very, very bad situation. And we we felt a burden for this little boy. And so we adopted him into our family. We renamed him Daniel Allen. Um, Daniel has always been one of my favorite Bible characters, but I wanted him to have my name also. So we named him Daniel Allen. And he looks quite young here. Um, my son Hans is being held by his mother uh, on the right side of the picture. Um, but at this point in time, Daniel was older than Hans. Daniel was 14 months old at this point. He looks quite small for a 14-month-old boy. And we were told, well, we knew he was sick when we got him. He had a lot of physical and probably mental disabilities when we adopted him. But there came a time after he was about eight months old, seven or eight months old, and he wasn't growing that we were told by the doctors, this child is not going to live. He has what is called failure to thrive. This is the only way we can explain it. He just cannot grow. And I, I really think it was probably one of the saddest, most difficult days of my life to hear that. He died the day after this picture was taken. But, um, but he was adopted in our home. And sometimes people ask, you know, well, can you... Can you really adopt a child into your home? Because how could you love an adopted child like you could love your genetic or biological child? And I can tell you this, that you certainly can do this. And I know you can do this because I've done it. And I know that this can be done not only because I've done it, but because the Bible says that God adopts us into his family and he loves us just the same. Now, this adoption process has continued in my family. This is a picture of my daughter, Heidi, with her husband, John David, and a judge that legally awarded uh, my granddaughter, Jillian, to them as an adopted child. And I can tell you that my love knows no bounds for this little girl. Here we are just after the, um, the legal proceedings were finished and the judge had given a, a little bag of gifts uh, to Jillian. She had planned on this, and so I was helping her sort through a few things. And so we went to a restaurant to eat after this, and we seemed, I guess, very, very happy. And so the waitress says, you know, is this a special occasion? What's going on? Oh, yes, it's a very special occasion. We've just adopted this little girl into our family. And so without our request, or without anything, they brought out this treat for her, and we just didn't see how we could say no that day to her. <laughs> But it was a big thing. And, you know, this is something that's happened in, in not only in just my family, but my brother's family. My brother adopted six children. He had three genetic biological children. He adopted six children. 
Oh, and I've got this spelled wrong. I'm sorry. His name is Andrew Stump, S-T-U-M-P. He's part of a forever family. And I want to just tell you a little bit about Andrew, if that's okay. Um, my, my brother and his family had already been involved in adoption. They had adopted three or four children up to this point. And they were going to different places and they would speak about adoption, where there were children that needed to be adopted and encourage people to adopt children and give them a good home. And and so Andrew, he met my dad and he said, would you please adopt me? Well, my brother, my brother said, well, you know, we'd like to, son, but, you know, we've already got a pretty big, pretty full quiver here. And, you know, we're encouraging good people that could help you out and maybe someone else will adopt you, yada, yada. But about three months later, they were. They were at another adoption um, seminar, and Andrew was still there. He hadn't been adopted yet. And he looked at my my brother, and he says, could I be your son? Would you adopt me? And my brother and, and, and his wife, they just talked about it, and they said, you know, we just couldn't say no. <laughs> you know, We didn't have any extra room in the house at the time, but we figured, you know, we'll figure it out. And so a few years ago, Andrew got married, and this is from his wedding. And during the reception, he gave one of the most touching, heartfelt speeches I've ever heard about what it was like to have a real father, a father who cared for him and loved him, and how precious it was to now be a part of a forever family. He was part of a forever family. And I just tell you, God has a forever family for us. And just so that you know, we're an equal opportunity adopting family. This is a, a picture of my nephew, Demetrius, and his family, his wife, Letitia, and their children. And we just love adoption. We love all that it stands for and can mean. But you know, it's interesting. I don't remember the day that I was physically born. And I know you don't remember the day you were physically born either. But friends, we can know the day and we can celebrate the day that we were spiritually born and adopted by God into this world. You know, again, people wonder if you can love an adopted child like a genetic child. And I want to promise you that there's a resounding yes to that. And it's just because God loves and agrees with adoption. Now, biblically, adoption in a biblical spiritual sense is the giving by God of the status and privileges of being his children. God adopts those who believe in him, and he grants them the benefit of eternal salvation. I invite you to open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to start reading in Galatians 4, and we'll read verses 4 and 5 here first. I have slides for those who can see that, and if you're on a phone or you don't have the connection to see the slide, uh, you, you're welcome to turn there. Galatians uh, chapter uh, four, verses four and five. And there it says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. Why did he do this? Why did God do this? That we might receive the adoption of sons. You see, friends, we don't automatically uh, come into this world spiritually as God's children. It's true he has a, a, a calling upon us. He has a right to call upon us by creation, but even much more so by redemption. And in Galatians chapter 4, now in verse 7, he says, Wherefore, thou art no more a servant. Now, the Greek word for servant here is doulos. It means slave. You're no more a slave. Well, that means we had been a slave before. We were servants of sin before we found Jesus. But he says, we're no longer slaves or servants of sin, but now a son, and if a son, an heir of God through Christ. And I just think that's so wonderful that we can be heirs, and we're going to see another text about that later in Romans. But we are no longer bound by the captivity of Satan and sin. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I've missed a slide here, haven't I? I have. So I'm going to ask you to turn with me to John chapter 8, verses 34 through 36. I didn't get this in the slides, and I'm sorry, but we can read this text. You have Bibles. 
It says, Jesus answered them, Verily, very I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, or the slave of sin. The Greek word is doulos. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So we are free in Christ. We become his children. We become heirs through faith. In 1 John chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2, he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Yes, in one sense, we are sons by creation, but in the, in the sphere that really counts, we are the sons of God by adoption. And it says, therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now we're the sons of God. We don't have to wait. We are now the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. I think that's such a wonderful promise to us. Now, I mentioned earlier that it spoke about being an heir. And we're going to read just a little bit more about this here in a second. But before we do that, in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 and 15, here again we read about adoption. And he says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For if you not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We have this, what Paul calls the spirit of adoption. And because this, we can say, Abba, Father. And I think most of you know that this term, Abba, this Aramaic word, Abba, it's just, that's what, it, that's how we, we don't try to translate it. It's just transliterated. But it is like an endearing term of expression for your father. Probably the closest in English we come to this is like the expression, daddy, daddy. And we can, we can call him not just simply formally our father. Yes, he is, but he's, he's our daddy too. And I think that's so precious. It is precious to me. And I think of my, my granddaughter, when she looks at her dad, she doesn't just say father, she says daddy. And that is so sweet. And I'm just so thankful for that. Now, continuing though in Romans it says, the Spirit itself beareth witness. I'm in verse 16 now. And if I'm going too fast, somebody chat in and say, slow down, Pastor. I'm not trying to go fast because our time may be cramped. We'll make the time and just naturally a little fast. And I have to try to slow myself down. So we'll do our best we can here. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. And notice, join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And so God makes us an heir, not only an heir, but a joint heir. And that means an equal heir with Christ. When my granddaughter Jillian was adopted, the judge made it clear that she is now legally entitled to any inheritance that a genetic child is entitled to. She can have anything that a genetic child has. And and this is what we are with God. He doesn't look upon us simply as, as renegades or as urchins or as unfit anymore. He looks upon us just like he looks upon Jesus Christ, as joint heirs with him. Because, you know, in John 17, 23, Jesus says that, that they may know that thou hast loved them as you love me. And how God could love us like he loves Jesus Christ, I fully don't understand it all. I don't claim to understand it. I don't profess to understand it. I don't need to understand it, but I can accept it and I can appreciate it. And so just as he loves us like Christ, he makes us, as it were, a joint heir with Christ. Now, these words, they don't say, if we are creatures, then heirs. Many people think that we're in the family of God because of that. But the Bible doesn't say that we're heirs just because of its creation. Neither does the text say that we are heirs because we are the sons of Abraham. Well, that's what the Jews thought. They thought that since they were genetically heirs of Abraham, it automatically made them children of God. But you remember, Jesus said to some of those people in John 8, and we read part of John 8 earlier, but in John 8, 44, he said, you're of your father, the devil. And so just having a physical genetic blood lineage means nothing. It's what happens spiritually, the spiritual adoption that we have. This text doesn't say anything about baptism, church membership, other works, rites, Friends, we must be spiritually born in the family of God. Jesus told Nicodemus, ye must be 
born again. And if children, even the poor of this world, are heirs of the kingdom, according to James 2.5. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt. This is Theodore Roosevelt Jr. He was the son of President Theodore Roosevelt. He was the only general to be on the beaches of Normandy with the first waves of troop of troops. He was going up and down the troops. He was one of the first persons off of the first carriers. And of course, if you know anything about the history of Normandy, you know that there were machine gun nests and they were blazing bullets at those troop carriers as soon as they lowered the ramps. On some of those, almost the entire group was 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 shot and killed. But he was like the first person out, like the first one. And he wanted to be there leading their charge, just like his father had years ago at, in, uh, up Kettle Hill in, in, uh, in San Juan Mountain. But, but the men said that he was just going back and forth and leading troops and assigning troops and cheering the troops on. He was just fearless. General Omar Bradley was asked to name the single most heroic action he had ever seen in compact combat, and he replied, Ted Roosevelt on Utah Beach. General Patton wrote in his diary that Roosevelt was one of the bravest men I've ever known, and a few days later, he served as a pallbearer at his funeral. Roosevelt had been assigned to the, the general governorship of the Philippines when he was younger. He was the governor of Puerto Rico. He was an assistant secretary of the Navy. Now, the reason I told you all that was to tell you this now to tell you this little story, because I want you to understand the kind of man that Roosevelt was. One day he was waiting to board a plane and during the wartime. And he had a reservation on his plane and he overheard this pitiful plea of one of the privates. And he was asking for a ticket at the window. He says, I'm going overseas in three days and I want to see my mom before I go. And he says, I can, I can only go home and back on a plane, you see, and, and it's the only way I can go. And so Roosevelt stepped forward and he said, I'll surrender my seat to him. And there was another officer there and he protested. And he said, this is a matter of rank. And Roosevelt said, that's right. He's a son. I'm only a general. Oh, friends, we might have wealth and rank in this world. But that means nothing compared to being a son of God. And since we are a son of God and joint heirs with Christ, and Christ is a son of God, that makes us brothers and sisters with Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, it says, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church, I will sing praise unto thee. Maybe you've done things in the past that's made your family ashamed. I know one time I did something terrible and I made my brother just so ashamed of me. Oh, he, he loathed me for a while, bless his heart, but, but he helped me. I was in a situation and I needed help and he helped me. But I know at that moment in time, he was ashamed of what I had done. Well, Maybe I should say, I don't know that he was ashamed of me, but I know he was ashamed of what I did. But the Bible says, despite of what we have done in the past, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren. You've probably heard of the famous English preacher, Charles Spurgeon. And on one occasion, he found a boy on the streets, and this little boy was ragged and hungry. And so Spurgeon took him to his house, and he, he gave him some clothes, and he fed him and uh, he was praying with him. And he kneeled down, he prayed with this little friendless boy as only Spurgeon could pray. And several times in the prayer, he referred to the Almighty as our Father. When the prayer was finished, the boy said, did you say our Father? Yes, my boy, yours and mine. Well, the little boy said, then we're brothers. Yes, gravely replied the pastor, and then he talked to him about the Lord Jesus Christ, and finally upon leaving, he instructed him to a certain boot dealer for a pair of boots. Well, a few days later, Spurgeon was passing the boot shop, and the dealer saw him and called out to him, and he said, I had a strange request the other day. A boy came into the shop, and he asked for a pair of boots, and he says that his brother sent him. I said, well, who's your brother? And he said, Charles Spurgeon. 
And Spurgeon said, that's right. And he's your brother too. And if you like, we'll share the cost of the boots. But friends, we, we are just adopted into the most wonderful family in the world. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, he says, Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. We are fellow citizens. We are equal citizens with the saints and all the household of God because we've been adopted by grace through faith into his family. Before we were strangers, we were foreigners, but now we have a changed status. Ellen White, writing eloquently in The Signs of the Times of March 9, 1882, in paragraph 14 said, and she's quoting here, of course, from Jesus in John uh, 3, 7, first, except a man be born again, unless he receives a new heart, new desires, purposes, motives, leading to a new life, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He must no longer remain in subjection to the power of sin. He is no longer to be a willing subject to the enemy of Christ. He is to become an heir of God by faith, a son of God by adoption. You see, friends, faith is what connects us. By God's grace, through faith, we are connected to where we can be an heir and adopted into the family of God. It has been God's plan to adopt us into his family from eternity past. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You see, friends, even in eternity past, God foresaw and knew the fall of Lucifer. He foresaw and knew of the fall of humanity. And so even in eternity past, he chose us, he pres predestinated us, if you please, to be adopted into his family because he knew you'd have to adopt us because we had become the servants of someone else. We'd become the servants of Satan and sin, but now he adopts us into his family. And this is indeed his great pleasure. The Apostle John says in first er, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, he says, But as many as received him, that is Christ, to them gave he power, the, the Greek word is exosia, it means delegated authority, to them gave he the authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, not the genetic thing, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but by God. We're born again, and we become adopted children and heirs because God has given us the authority to be his children. This word power, again, is a word that means authority. It's not that he gave us some kind of intrinsic power that enables us to, to, to take a place, you know, on, on the stage or on the throne with God, but he's given us the authority. And, of course, he's certainly given us all the power to change our lives, to redeem our lives, if you please. But all this comes from God. There's a story that one time the French general and emperor, Napoleon, we've all heard of Napoleon, and his horse ran away. But a lowly soldier caught him and brought him back. And Napoleon said simply, thank you, captain. Thank you, captain? Well, the man at once went, gathered up his stuff, left where the enlisted men were, and went right to the officer's quarters and to their mess. The emperor called him captain, and therefore he became an officer. And when God calls us his children, friends, we become his children. We're all miserable sinners, but when we receive Jesus Christ, he calls us sons of God. Let us then, friends, promptly pack our belongings and move into the higher life to which he has pointed us. As fully, legally, in every respect, the children of God, our Father, just as physical children can expect their fathers to care for them, so our Father cares for us. A physical child expects the parents to do things, and that child could be then an adopted child. And when uh, when parents bring a child into the home, I mean, under 
the right circumstances under normal conditions. It's because those people want that child in their home and they want to help that child and they plan to help that child and they don't plan to let that children go hungry. They don't plan to let that children have rags for clothes. It is their expectation to care for that child and they will do everything in their power to care for that child. But how much more, friends, our Heavenly Father, who has the the power to do anything, has the resources of the universe at his fingertips, how much more will he provide for the things that we need? And so this brings to my mind a text that I think is really important here. It's in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. And it begins by saying, be careful for nothing. Now, this, this word careful, if you study the, the history behind it, it used to mean something very different than it means today. It used to mean to worry or to fret about things. And that really is the, the emphasis of this word. It comes from a, a Greek word, merimno, and it means to be anxious or worry, and it's related to uh, merina, which is the noun form of the word. They're, they're, they're basically the same word. One is simply the verb form. The other is the noun form of the word. Now, this Greek word was used in a second century manuscript and in a sentence, and this man says, I'm writing in haste to prevent you from being anxious or worried, for I will see that you are not worried. And it's, it's the same Greek word. And so it carries the concept of being anxious or worried. The force of the word in the Greek is that of forbidding the continuance of an action already going on. And in fact, it's 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 an emphatic uh, verb. It's used in an emphatic form. This is something you must do. And, it's, and it carries, if you look at the, the, the Greek morphology of it, it carries the contents of continual action. In other words, you're not just to quit worrying once, you're continually to quit worrying. And so we could actually translate Philippians 4, 6, something like this. Stop perpetually worrying about even one thing. This same Greek word is found in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. He says, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought. In other words, don't worry for your life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. So tell me, Jesus, you said not to worry for your life. Why is it that I don't need to worry about what I'm going to eat or drink or put on my body or all these things? It's because your heavenly father knoweth that you have need of these things. And he is your father who has adopted you into his family. And because he has, he has taken the responsibility to be your father, he will do all the duties of a father, including providing, caring, and watching over you. Isn't that a wonderful thought? I, I just think that's so, so important. So we have here in this verse, the same force, the same uh, mor morphology of the Greek here. It means stop perpetually worrying. And we don't have to worry because God is going to watch over us. In 1 Peter 5, 7, a text that probably most of us know, it's a very short, simple verse, but it says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. In other words, this first word that we translate care is from that same Greek word that means don't worry. Cast all your worries upon him. Cast all of your cares upon him because he cares for you. We trans the, the Greek word that we translate cast here is not the ordinary word in Greek, which means to throw, but one, one which means or signifies a definite act of the will in committing to him our worrying, giving them up or all of our worries to him. This means that we are through worrying about any matter at all. We will let God assume the responsibility for our welfare in the premise. And that is just what he desires to do. We are to commit to him all of our worries or the things that would worry us if we assumed the responsibility. But we don't have to do that because he cares for us. The Greek word for careth is not the word for worry in the Greek. The expression in the original literally means it is a care of it is a care to him concerning you. That is, friends, your welfare is his concern. He, in bringing you in salvation into the, his family, has undertaken the responsibility of caring for your welfare. There was a, a man on record in an early Greek manuscript with the name Paiti dos Armenos. 
And the first name was simply a proper name. But the second name is made up of the Greek word, which means the word that we just mentioned a bit ago. But it carries the Greek letter alpha, or what we, the equivalent of R -E in front of it. And you have to understand something about, about Greek. When you have a, a, a certain word and you put that A in front of it, what it is, it's like putting a negative symbol in front of it. And it makes it the opposite of what it was. And so apparently this was a pagan man who worried all the time. But after he found Christ and, and, and was converted, his name was changed to the man who never worries. To the man who never worries. I thought that was good. Now today, maybe in our lives, we've been tempted to worry. We've been tempted to feel like we have nothing that can commend us to God. Why should God take me into his kingdom? I don't have anything to give him. I'm in just a bad shape. Well, I want to tell you a little story about Dr. Thomas John Bernardo. Now, this man was called a doctor, but and he had studied medicine, but I don't think, from my understanding, he ever fully got a medical degree, but he was called doctor a lot. But he was a friend of the friendless. He was someone like, um, uh, well, he, he set up orphanages and homes to care for children. And one day as he was going along the streets, there was a dirty, ragged little boy that called to him and, and requested that he might be taken into one of his homes. And, uh, well, Bernardo said, I don't know you, my lad. What have you to recommend to me? And the little boy just looked down at his rags and his clothes. And he said, I thought, I thought these would be enough. Pointing to his rags. And Dr. Bernardo gathered him up in his arms and he took him in. Beloved, God wants to adopt you into his family. He wants you to be a part of a forever family. He only wants your permission. You have nothing in your hands to bring. You just have rags. But simply to the cross we cling. To the cross we cling and ask God to bring us into his family. And you know what? He has promised to do this. As many as received him, to them gave you the authority to become the sons of God. Friends, when you are a member of the family of God, you can celebrate. We don't need to go get the ice cream that my granddaughter had that day. But friends, what a joyous time. It is the most joyous thing in the world to know Jesus Christ and to serve him. Now, some of you I know, and many of you I don't know. And I understand this is being recorded, so maybe this will be posted sometime. If it is, that's nice. But I don't know everyone out there, and maybe there's someone who's hearing my voice today or will hear it later, who has never accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Maybe you felt unworthy to come to Jesus. Maybe you didn't feel the need to come to Jesus, but today you know that you need Jesus. Today you realize that the filthy rags you have, because the Bible says all of our righteousness is plural. Everything that we think is good about us is as, but as filthy rags. And you want Jesus in your life today. Friends, all you have to do is receive Jesus by grace through faith. Just ask him to come into your heart. Say, Father, forgive me for my sins, uh, for Christ's sake. And he has promised to do this. He says that he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we will simply confess our sins and repent of those evil things we've done in the past, he will accept you and he will accept you today. And so that's my appeal to you. We don't have an altar to come to. We're here in a virtual church. I can't say come up to the altar. But friends, you can kneel down right where you're at. And I'm going to pray and I want you to pray with me that God will touch your heart. And he will uh, help you to be his child because he, he's promised he will. And maybe if you want to recommit your life to Jesus today, you know, you can do that knowing, not questioning today, not wondering, but knowing that you are an heir and a joint heir with Christ. And that God loves you like he loves his son. And he's going to give you the things that he gives his son to. What a blessing. What a great God we serve, friends. I invite you where possible to kneel down with me or bow your head as we ask a blessing. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for your blessings to us. I want to thank you so much for your care to us. And I ask, Father, that you will please bless and uh, watch over this church family that has so graciously invited me to share with him today. I ask that uh, the, this, um, this talk, this message, these thoughts 
uh, will continue to be a blessing in a special way to someone, that someone will give their life to Jesus today and say, yes, Lord, I want to be an heir, even a joint heir with Christ. I want to be adopted in your family. I want to be a part of your forever family. Oh, Father, don't let us delay. If we are hesitating today, there's no need to hesitate. We have a Savior who's longing to have us come. He stretches out his hands with those nail prints of Calvary that prove his love, those nail prints that prove the Father's love in giving his only begotten Son. So please bless this little congregation, each one I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.